Welcome back to another episode of Adoption Unfiltered. I am your co-host, Kelsey Vanderbilt Ranyard. I'm a birth mom, and I'm here with my other co-host, Sarah Easterly, an adoptee, and Lori Holden, an adoptive mom. All right. We are so happy uh, to also have April Dinwoody with us here today. Um, so excited. It's such a pleasure to have you here, April. Thanks for joining us. We, um, we've been running this uh, new series on our podcast, um, Adoption, um, Activism, and Advocacy Series, and it, it was like, we have to have April on here. April has been such a um, major player in adoption advocacy and information and activism for so many years. Um, we were just, um, before we started recording, saying that I won't read her entire resume because that'll take up the whole episode. There's so much um, that you've accomplished and that you do and continue to do in this space, April. So um, I will just leave it at that um, you're a nationally recognized voice on adoption, foster care, multiracial, multicultural families. Um, you've created mentoring programs for youth and foster care. Um, you've got a a long, rich history. You're president of the board of directors for the Adoption Knowledge Affiliates and on and on, and just a fiercely dedicated leader and um, podcaster as well, host of um, two podcasts, Born in April, um, Born in June, Raised in April, um, as well as a brand new one that um, I, I've gotten to hear your first episode and it's fantastic, Calendar Conversations. Um, both of which educate and inspire conversation about adoption, identity, and family diversity. So um, it's a true pleasure to have you here, April. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a joy and an honor. So appreciate being here with you. So where to begin? Where to begin? I think, um, you know, it's been well over a decade or two, maybe um, you've done so much and seen so much. I guess I, I'd love to just begin with the question of, um, does anything still surprise you in this space? <laughs> oh, gosh, my ability to hold complexity surprises me on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. Um say more about that. There's a lot of complexity in adoption. So <laughs> which complexities? <laughs> On any given day, any number of things. When you're in the space of activism, education, advocacy, you, you, you purposefully place yourself in the presence of the system the people who have been part of family separation, the people who have elected to become parents through adoption, foster care, and then of course, the community of, of those folks that have been separated from family of origin and professionals that, that are part of all the things. So it, it depends on the day and who I'm having a conversation with. I also have a lot of space that I make for young people, which that would also be what surprises me most is how in tune and aware young people are of what they need and 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 the gap and the and the and the sort of the the, the space between what they're getting and what they can actually put into words that they can do that when they're asked and when they're engaged and the space that that exists between what they're getting and what they need that surprises me regularly because we're so i think that's a it's a both and in any number of 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 actual scenarios and situations present present themselves on any given day i really appreciate that um i so appreciate that it's so there's so many complexities <laughs> and adoption. And it is really interesting when you get in there um, to, to see that and to live it and, and to hold that both. And I think that asks a lot of us um, when you say it surprises you, um, was this harder to do back when you were first starting, starting out in this space, or is it something you've just happened to be a, a natural kind of, is this one of your gifts that you've always been able to kind of live in those nuances definitely as a smaller human without language for what was happening and without a lot of presence of 
elders and grownups around me that could help me navigate it much harder as a young person and also built in some some of my own operating systems as a child and a youth into my young adult life that that served me well in terms of uh i would say not running away from the hard things but sort of running towards them so so that was sort of always has been a, a thing that i didn't i didn't reject the complexity or look away from it i, I kind of ran ran towards it which I don't know where that comes from, but that coupled with a container that my family built, that I, my family of experience, as I call them, my adoptive family, the one I, what I experience the most of in my life, wholesomeness, grounding in the earth. We lived on a farm, animals, really solid, good food, um, Act, act, physical activity outdoors, the beach, the all of those things sort of compiled to make it kind of all the right ingredients for me to be a little bit more centered in that complexity and, and running towards it. Same time, I think that the, the the real the the reality of all that is that there were some things that I just didn't have the capacity to do, didn't were I wasn't able to do yet. I mean marriage and children. Those are two, those are the two, those are two big compromises from this kind of work early on that as, you know, a person in midlife, those things didn't happen that the, you know, the birthing a child isn't going to happen. So there's, there are some, there's some compromises and some, some, some real painful realities of all that work early on, both, you know, emotional output, work labor output that 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 sort of kept those two things um in some ways from happening yeah like um the sacrifice <laughs> the the sacrifice that you made um it's it when you bring up your family i i think um you know to me just in reflecting on what you said earlier i i've heard just even the beginning days of your podcast where you say very you know vocally i can love my parents and i want to speak up about the things that don't work for me about adoption so again that both and space that you live in so well um what are some of the things that that aren't where i mean uh I'm opening a can of worms here because i know there's a lot that's not working in adoption but i'd love to hear your perspective, like what are your dreams and vision for getting things, you know, just righting the wrongs of adoption? Yeah. Where do we begin? Yeah. Well, I, I think first and foremost, I think one of the most foundational elements that needs to change as a, as a systematic reality is stopping sealing the birth certificate upon finalization of adoption. I, I think that would shift a lot of things. The fact that we still do that is an indication and a signal to the system that you can re you can you can redirect identity, you can amputate family of origin, you can reposition someone's identity and and you can legally keep something from from an individual. Their 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 core of who they are you can keep from them. So so to me that's Problematic. And I've actually shifted some of my thinking with this over the many, many years. And I, I believe in opening the records, but I, I actually want to spend, you know, in, in some way time on, on not closing the records. I mean, because if if that that would be a big signal to also open opening them. I mean, if we could do, stop closing them, opening them in states that didn't have that time, it would it would be easier for folks. So so that's one very fundamental thing that I think would shift a lot because again, that is a big neon sign to families and system that says this is okay. Like we, we have the ability to do this. So why would this matter? So I feel like that's, that's a huge, huge thing. Family preservation is like top on my list when it makes sense. Cause it doesn't always, when you think about this cycle of what families are in at their essence and the disruption that can happen in any given state of family. 
ultimately grownups don't get what they need as kids. So some people are not really equipped to parent, no matter how you slice it. It doesn't, you know, it just, it's just not a thing. So I, I want to keep closing that gap. I want to keep closing it and closing it, closing it um, with purpose. But if there's a long tail on how that would be, how would that would be real? Uh, so many intersecting things, things that, that happen on each other, but the, but the, the goal is there. Um, as lofty as it could be, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's a house of cards and we have to, we have to keep collectively pushing for, you know, better, better policy, better coverage of policy for all. Um, more accountability, totally, more, more accountability totally, yeah. and, and some soft places for grownups to land that didn't get what they needed. Absolutely. Like, I mean, I was working at a youth summit this weekend in, in outside of, Cleveland and the young people that were involved in this were not part of, you know, specifically there for adoption or foster care, but we had a lot of discussions about family. And when asked about what they needed as far as this group, the, the facilitator said, like, so we we canvass the kids all the time, or the young people, and they we say, what would you like to know more about? And something that comes up regularly is I want to learn how to manage my money. I want to learn how to budget and manage my money. And I want to know how to help my parents with their trauma. Wow. Out of the mouth of babes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and here we thought we were hiding it so well. We adoptive parents. We thought we couldn't be seen, <laughs> but we're seen. We are so seen by our kids, especially our adoptees. I think about too, like the generational impacts of people that didn't get what they need. And I think my family is such a shining example of that because I'm the fourth generation to relinquish a child for to terminate our parental rights in like one bloodline. And like I was raised by my dad, who's an adoptee. And I and I'm like, there's so much like he didn't get. And then when I look at his birth mom who passed in 2021, there's way more that she didn't get. And it's and even like to stop the bleeding in adulthood. Wow, like what an impact that could have made um for everybody. But I mean future generations and everything. I think it's, we have to start, we have to start really looking at things um, with their intergenerational impact because that's truly what we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 so stark to me and it's so clear where that reality sets up in my own life, watching my parents' relationship to their parents and both had complicated relationships to their families. Um, and, and, and as most families do, and most parents and children have complicated relationships, like, okay, we get that. Um, but both were set up such that my mom had beautiful relationships with her, her parents. And then her mother was killed early. You know, when my, my, my sister was just a baby and my mom was a, a young mom. She never got to mourn her mother's loss because the people around our community were like, okay, Sandy, let's go. Um, you've got children and a husband to take care of now, now nice new England, you know, like hearty people. She never got to mourn her mother that she had. So when it came time for me to mourn the mother that I didn't have, she had no, almost no capacity to understand why I would mourn a mother I didn't have when she didn't get to mourn the mother she did. Right. So, so, so there's that. So I have to like, okay. So then my dad disassociated with his family because it was, he elected to do that and, and, and cut them off in a way or was cut off, whatever happened. But it was like, eh, whatever, we can get like, we got like, so it, he was like, so there's no room for them to understand my feelings of need for family of origin because of their experiences. So it's that kind of stuff that I can name so clearly, but that happens in all families where someone didn't get to do this. And then, then there's this like burden on a child or a family just gets disrupted this way. And it's, it's not clear to the children why, or, and, and, and so my goodness, if we can close the gap on some of this and our families, Kelsey, to your point, there's an intergenerational pattern, right? So, wow. Right. That's kind of something we need to look at as hard as it might be, but it's something we need to look at and, and not that we're 
test cases for things and we don't we don't exist so that society can be better but we might as well open up the door to some of this if well, we we're can. here right yeah. <laughs> we're right here I, that's exactly right that's so interesting that you said that i saw i don't remember something on social media someone was complaining about adoption which we all do because of course it, it is deserved <laughs> um but then they said well i don't i don't want to get involved in anything to change it because i i don't feel like i need to and like it's not that we, it's not that that's my responsibility to do it, but it's like, it is, I do feel the responsibility, even if you've been victimized by like the system of it, I do feel like there's a responsibility to future generations collectively as, as a society. And so I think, I don't know, how do you feel about that? What's our responsibility? I think it's hard, Kelsey, you know, yeah. I find, I, you know, I feel like I've been able to shoulder a bunch of it and it's very complicated. We spoke a little bit before I've been able to shoulder more of it because I don't have, I don't have a family that I look after. So I do feel like I can go all in on some of this stuff. And I, and, and, and with, with the right calibration of my own caretaking, like to make sure that I'm not, you know, expending so much energy that becomes unhealthy for me. I do feel that responsibility. However, I will also say that being in this community for as long as I have, I've seen so many folks that like just can't and, and, and sometimes are in it believing they can and actually making it worse. So that's not a, that's not a, a, a mean spirit or, 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 or in a way like it, it's, I think it's just true. It's not a judgment. I think it's just true. Totally. And, yeah, and I, and I'm too many times I've been in that where I'm just like, I want to hold this person in it. And I do that. And then I, I, I almost like want them to tap out because I, I've, when, yeah. as a leader, it's hard for me to do both at the same time. Like I, I can't hold that and this, and then lead and elevate things. It's just, it's oh, yeah. much. So I, I do worry about that. You know, folks that feel responsibly, but haven't done their own personal grounding work to be able to be in it in a healthy way. Yeah. Um, I, I tension. witnessed the same. <laughs> yeah, I totally get it. Lori, you had something I know you wanted to ask. Yeah. And then I, and then I want to hear from Sarah too, but um, I'm noticing both from your story, April and Kelsey, your story and Sarah, you too, that you're all cycle breakers and not everybody is. And I think that's one of the themes I'm hearing from this advocacy series is there's something that is internal to us who are willing to enter the space and do some work and take some heat that makes us want to stop the cycle. Um, so I, was there any, any like turning event for you, April, or a um, couple of events, or is this just how you're wired? That's a great question. Uh, it might be just how I'm wired. And I, I, I think also the differences of race dynamic come into this so sharply because it did it did always feel that just by existing, there was a protest of some sort. <laughs> like there was, there was a, some kind of a reality of tension and difference and, um, but not in the way that was a constant fight. It was a constant. Not a fight, but a, a tension. There was like this thing that, and, and, and and I I don't know I don't think there was one one event I, the one event that actually had me move into a space of action was the rejection of my mother of origin that was a life a life changing event as a grown up believing that believing the narrative that she loved me so much that this was the path you know, she chose for me, never quite, never, never quite added up to me, never smelled right. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I love my books. I hug them. I hold them. I love my dog. I hug it. I hold it. I love my baby doll. I, lo I love it. I hold it. So like, I don't like, that doesn't make any sense to me. So like, nah, I don't know if that, I don't, I don't know if I believe all that. So in essence, it was proven that the, maybe there wasn't that love for me because she rejected me. However, however, um, so 
so that that point, I when that rejection happened, I went into sort of deep healing mode. Um, mm-hmm. Could do some things that helped me through that, thankfully. But then I was like, well, I gotta, I gotta do something with this energy. I gotta help. So that was when Adoptment was born. Adoption, you know, mentoring adopted adults, mentoring youth in foster care. Because I thought, hey, if this is hard for me, and I'm grown up, I'm working, I can take a little time off. I have health insurance. I can talk to health professionals. I can go home and get a hug from my mom. Like I like. I can do all this stuff and I'm still gutted. Like what is going on for youth in foster care? Do they have enough? So that, so that was born. So that was the first, and then went to a foster care agency as a grown up. I was like, yo, this is bananas. What is happening here? Like, wh- why does it smell so bad? Why are the walls a weird color? Like, why is there no, like nothing? Like, this is not fun. This is not for kids. Like what is going on? So that was a, a pinpoint time of, of real activism, like action, uh, you know? So that was, but, but to close the loop on the whole thing of love and, and thinking like, oh, she must not have loved me after all. Um, I found a letter that um, I had sent to her. Well, no, my, my biological half sister found a letter. I had sent my birth mom a bunch of stuff when I first got in contact with her, a big package of stuff. And she sent it all back to me um, with this, like, I don't want to, I don't want to be in touch. And I thought, well, well, she didn't, get rid of it. She sent it back to me. I was like, there's an upside to that. I mean, I was, I was like, okay, at least it wasn't destroyed and I got it back. Okay. So these were the days before I did copy everything, but there were some original things in there. So in some ways as heartbroken as I was, I was like, okay, my bio, my birth mother then passes and I don't get, I've never, you know, I'd never meet her in person as a, as a grown up. But fast forward to my half sisters going through her things and she brings me, she in New York, she brings me something. She, they were in Hawaii. Um, so she came from Hawaii and I spent some time with her, my half sister. And she said, Oh, I found something in Helen's things. I said, Oh, this is a letter. I pulled it out. I pulled it out. Was She saved one of the letters that I had sent. Okay. Number one. So I put it away. Right. And I was like, Oh, that's, a, I was like, Oh, wow. That's amazing. I didn't study it. I wrote it. Right. So I didn't like look at it hardcore. Like I just, I, I look, I put it away. I was looking for another letter, found that letter last year, opened up the letter and I, my heart almost stopped because I opened the letter and I looked, I never noticed there were three teardrops on the letter. I hadn't seen them. And I was like, oh my gosh, she cried. And I was like, and I, you know, I believe that that settled. And I, well, I, the love narrative never passed the smell test, but I felt deeply loved in the universe and in the world. I felt, I felt loved by my parents, even though they didn't give me what I needed. I felt, I felt a deep sense of love for myself, you know, hard times for sure. Like, but I've, I've always felt like a deep sense of love. And so I also didn't believe that she didn't love me. Right. I I didn't believe that. And, but I didn't know how to know it for sure. Right. But when I looked at that letter again and I saw those three teardrops, I was like, holy smokes, she cried. And something inside of me was like, okay, April, like, okay, 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 okay. Wow. So powerful. I mean, I do, I just had a conversation last week with someone we were um, talking about just back to intergenerational trauma and, and other generations. And it was, it was almost, it was a, I can't remember the book she was referring to. I, w- I want to go, I'm going to have to send her a note after this and send it to all of you after and put it in the show notes, but um, talking about baby boomers and the greatest generation above them. And just the, a lot of, they didn't have the emotional tools. And I think the point of it was we need to stop kind of referring to them as narcissists and labeling them because they were really emotional stuck. And that greatest generation didn't have, they were trying to survive. There were wars, there were, depression, there's just all these things that in affect their parenting. And then you add in the trauma of relinquishing your child and having no space, probably didn't have the space to grieve it either. Like your mom didn't get to grieve her mom. And um, to recognize those little glimmers um, and to let those sink in, even if they're not the way you really, your heart really yearns for, because it wasn't, you didn't get what your heart was deeply yearning for that real that golden reconnection. But um, anyway, it's just fascinating. I'm kind of at the place where I'm 
I'm trying to accept that in my family too. And, and see the, you know, if there's evidence of the tears or any feeling or then, you know, it's just stuck in there and you have to, <laughs> it may not be this big expression that I want, but it's, it's there and it's wrapped up in so much pain and heartache. It's yeah. Well, I'm sorry for, for you that you didn't get that, but I also am really touched by that recognition of the, the tears. Sorry, I Kelsey, I keep back. talking. <laughs> no, you're good. I want to go back to the, um, cause we hear this all the time, right? What, what you said about, um, my birth mother loved me so much that she gave me a better life or gave me X, Y, Z fill in the blank here. Um, but, uh, we hear this all the time from adoptees speaking up that like, that didn't smell right. Like you said, that didn't make sense to me. That made me equate love with abandonment or rejection. And so, but I think for birth moms, when we hear that, um, and that's something that we kind of were conditioned to believe too, like that was the, how the gears turned in our mind. Um, and so in our like decision-making process, when we were going through and deciding, um, you know, on adoption, that sentiment um, also is a way to, uh, it's like a balm for us as we go through, right? Like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And it's like, whatever reason that you're doing this, like you're doing this mainly out of some sort of desperation. And so you're trying to be like, but I, you're trying to make sense of that both and when you're going through this process too. So you're like, I do love this child. I'm looking at this child in the hospital and holding my son. I love him more than life itself. I also can't parent for whatever reason. So I think those sentiments get mixed up and then gets put into a justification, which is not. Um, and so I want to say that from the birth parent side because I'm not I'm not trying to justify that justification, but I also am like, how do we, how do we? And this might be a question that nobody has an answer to, and that's totally fine. But I think it's something to ponder. How do we express that love for our child, and? and uh, help our child understand our love for you is what it is. It's not a justification for relinquishment, but it is still there. So like, how do we live in the- It's holding, yeah, it's holding that, it's ho it's just holding it at the, yeah. that, that same, that both end. And I appreciate you sharing all that because I think part of my advocacy and activism is rooted in helping systems and parents, all parents, origin and experience parents, all both and of all of us, you know, in holding it. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a parent or birth or experienced parent, but I am, you know, very close to many, um, is that we have to start talking about it such that if a parent who is entrusted with a child through adoption doesn't know for sure that a parent of origin loved them and expressed that love, they shouldn't say that that's what it is. Right. And so the justification for openness and adoption, not always everybody's doing every holiday together and having right. sleepovers and brushing each other's hair and having, you know, all that, like, that'd be great if we were that close, but you know, if not, then the openness of the idea of, and the connection of grownups talking about these deep things, because if my parents had had a conversation with Helen and there was some connectivity, they might know, yeah, she deeply expressed her love for you, April, mm -hmm. and didn't think she could parent mm -hmm. that if there was a, if, if there was a little bit more of that, it was just, she loved you so much. And then the conversation ended. I was like, Oh, I think there's more to the story yeah. and getting people in that space and time to be able to have that conversation in a healthy way just closes that gap a little bit. And, and as, a, as, a, as we've, I've had evidence of very many young people, they, they just are ready for more and the grownups aren't. So yeah. we, we, you know, we really, I, I think have to, especially the love part, especially and, the love part. And, and also we have to not disenfranchise moms birth moms from, from being able to express that, that grief or that feeling, because uh, otherwise, oh, you know, we're also, we're then intergenerationally hurting the adoptee because when you 20 plus years later, or even 10 years, I mean, with openness now, we, we just do have more opportunities for contact. Um, 
when whenever they do have that opportunity, like we we want moms to meet that moment and it's rise a lot to of work. Yeah, it's it is heavy, heavy lift because we're disrupting the system. We're di no one ever thought we'd be here. No. You know, no one ever thought we'd be all here together talking about these things. No one ever thought there would be DNA searches you could do with fitting into a tube. No, this wasn't part of the plan. No. So we're here now and we are the ones who are saying, okay, we don't have all the answers, but we have to start opening this up. And it's not going to be as elegantly redirected, redesigned, disrupted, and rebuilt as any of us would like, I don't think. But this is the part, these are the parts that help it along its way. That's such an important point that you make, April, too. Like, no one ever thought we'd be here because I feel like throughout the course of the history of adoption, you know, maybe if we look at the past century of it, we have all been playing telephone. <laughs> um, and there's been so much secrecy and everything. And now we're blowing it wide open. But even with like our book and this project and this podcast, um, having the these sides that have been siloed come together, have a conversation um, and, and line up the facts. Um, here's my truth. Here's your truth. Here's your truth. And we're like, does this make sense to you? Does this make sense to you? And I, and you're right. I don't think anybody who designed this system to be what it is ever thought that there would be a day where we were comparing notes with each other. But I mean, how powerful and what a privilege that we can do so now. Yeah. Openness and transparency. Um, and that feeds into, um, I loved what you said, April, about messaging and how we have, we as adoptive parents are the gatekeepers, not only for the message, but often for the birth parents themselves, the, the families of origin. And so to make sure that that is true and wisely delivered is really important. And so I just want to thank you for your, I think it's your new project that you unveiled it in 2024. I had the chance to listen to the January episode of it. It, it was a short episode. I don't know if they're all going to be short. Um, so it's very easily consumable. Um, and you said in one sentence, something that I thought was so um, encapsulated, adoptive parenting messaging coming from a place of this, and this is what you, you said, something like, you were talking to frame it, you were talking about um, holidays, like, for example, the um, birthdays of birth family members. And why wouldn't you do that? Because without them, there's no you. And I did in that one sentence, you just went like, Oh, yeah, that's right. That's a way to value and bring that value in and live from that mutual value and respect. So I just wanted to say that's amazing. I can't wait for February's to come out and then March and so on. Thank you. They're all going to be short. I, I want to keep them tight and have those moments of, oh, right. And I did, if that had happened, if there was just an acknowledgement that someone else was in this mix, even if I couldn't see them or touch them or talk to them or whatever, it just, just validating that these other people existed and we didn't even maybe know when their birthdays were, but everybody has a birthday, everybody's born. It would have done so many things to ground me and then ground my connection to generations. Um, and so it's an it, it's conceivably an easy thing or in theory, it's easy when you haven't been thinking in that way and no one's held you accountable to think in that way. Sometimes for parents, it's just, it's too far. They just can't figure it out, but we're going to keep at it until... <laughs> You make some, you know, and some parents are, I mean, I, the, the, the way that I can keep doing this work is so many parents are voluntarily showing up and saying, I, I, like, I'm here, I'm listening. What, what else do I need to know? So to me, that's like a, that's such a, it's food for my soul. And, and I'm just going to try to keep showing up with them. Thank you for listening. That really means a lot to me, Lori. Yeah. Um, you probably have no shortage of content for adoptive parents and through, for that, for the calendar conversations. Um, can you give us a teaser of some of the other <laughs> things yeah. you're going to be talking about? Well, for those who don't know and haven't heard any bits of my story, my, my mother of origin, Helen June, named me June Elizabeth when I was born. Her mother, my maternal grandmother was June there are many Junes, including a new baby June in my family of, of origin. I am connected to some of them, even post my mother of origin's death. And 
not connecting with her, other folks connected with me and I have relationships with them. So it's lovely. Birth father's um, still a, a, a quandary and trying on all the platforms and all the things, but not yet. Um, so my adoptive parents, knowing that they would be having a girl placed with them, me, just liked the name April. And so I'm also born in October. So it, the calendar didn't make a lot of sense in a way to me. And, and so I did this six word memoir project at a thing with Joyce McGuire Pavo many years ago and Penny, um, this woman, Penny, who is amazing. Uh, and my six words were born in June, raised in April. And once I had those six words, I thought, okay, the calendar, like, as I thought about it, I was like, man, the calendar is so goofy for me because I'm all these names and my birthday is here. My birthday kind of, mm, I don't know. And what about Mother's Day and Father's Day? So I created a system of, of using the calendar to help parents, professionals understand belonging and inclusivity for adopted persons. Um, so I have all that content. So, I mean, February is an easy one. It's the intersection of love and, and, and racial identity. March is all about luck and good fortune and adoption. You know, you love that topic and go on and on for that for days. And then April, we talk about naming and claiming. And a lot of this stuff is like sort of basic adoption. The lens of it is there. But when I, when I really zoom out, it's true that all parents benefit from this type of thinking. And when, if, if, if like, if all parents could get on board, even with, and not that my content is so amazing, but I, I think it's good enough. And, and certainly because it's attached to the calendar, it's, it's really a great learning modality because it's universal. Everybody has to deal with the calendar. Um, it's, it's, you, you, you sort of, you're, you're on rinse and repeat. So these lessons can keep coming back around. So it's a great learning like structure. And, and the truth is, if, if all parents did that, I think we'd have less adoption. Like, I think there's a closing the loop of this because if, if parents are more plugged in to the things that they didn't really maybe understand as, as parents or, or didn't get, because that's what ends up coming up. It's not just about the young person that's entrusted to a parent through adoption. It's about them. You know, like it's really, it, it's, it's, it's gotcha, surprise. It's really, we're not going to talk about your kid. We're talking about you. <laughs> um, I mean, of course we talk about the young people, but. Anyway, hopefully that helps. You mentioned Joyce Pavo, Joyce McGuire Pavo, and she's someone I feel like, you know, if I picture like a pyramid of all the activists and educators, she's she's one of the base, <laughs> the foundational base uh, people down there. Um, so wonderful. And I'm, she's just a living legend. It's so great. We've had her on the show too. And it was just such an honor. She wrote the foreword to our book. But um, I would love to hear you talk about others who have supported you throughout the years, just um, in terms of just that pyramid of of, of activists and, mm. and advocates. Well, Joyce is one of the originals. She's the OG for me. And um, I must say, Dr. Joyce McGuire Pavo, I should have said that right out the gate, double doctorate, just as equally academically excellent as she is emotionally engaged and loving and kind. I, I, they're, they're both so, so, so present with her just got to see her last year it was really nice um had been a while so she's foundational i i mean i i met sheila gans sheila gans was one of the first parents of origin that i ever met and she had her film um on uh what was what was her first film i can't remember the name of it now i i see the see the sort of the gray um so Sheila Gans was a filmmaker. She made a film about her life. I met her. She was one of the first, again, birth parents, parents of origin that had a relationship with. So she was very, she was like an important person um, in, in my early days. And I got very lucky, I think, because I met some great adoptive parents, Kim Stevens, who shows up a lot in activism work. And she's the president of the board of what's now called Families Rising was previously called um, the, the North Atlantic Council on Adoptable Children. Yeah, we changed, we helped change that name to Families Rising. So Kim Stevens is, a, is a, an amazing adoptive parent. So I've been around so many people like her that were 
just amazing and foundational. N newer, like maybe the last 10, 15 years, Rich House has been an amazing friend and part of my network and several others that I can't, you know, um, you, if I name them all, but um, I, I find them and collect sort of folks across generations who I feel really a kinship with. Um, a lot of transracial adoptees, uh, Rachel Nordlinger, she's really not in the adoptee advocacy space, but she's in the, you know, black activism, works with um, Reverend Sharpton and um, Rebecca Carroll, this big impacts on me um, over time and have really made a big difference. And, and people you don't know that I, you know, have been in relationship to for many, many years, decades that really helped me, really helped me have community. It's just been so wonderful, April, to hear your journey, your inner journey, your outer journey, you, what your lessons learned, your um, lessons shared, and how you you kind of take this both and approach with being big and expansive and covering the polar the multiple polarities that you cover, but also being humble and open to learning and close to the earth. You know, I heard that maybe growing up on a farm had something to do with your being able to stay close to the earth and, and grounded. Um, so I, I just really appreciate all of that. Do you have anything that you'd like to tell us in closing? Just gratitude for healing spaces and for the, the collaborative conversation that you create and the way that you've curated content so that folks can, can consume it and be, be beyond their journey of discovery and healing. So just gratitude to the three of you for making this space, for inviting me into it. And whether we connect often or not, I was telling, I was at Adoption Network Cleveland this morning with Betsy Norris, who's, you know, also kind of an OG and, um, I don't, I'm not, you can't be everywhere, but there is such a, a settling of my soul knowing that, that folks are in it and doing it. And we may not connect often, but like, you're with me, like you're, you're with me. And I feel that. And I think it should be said that it's, it's not just because we don't talk maybe often knowing that you're out here doing this is just really settling to my soul. So I'm appreciative of that. Thank you. And, and I feel the same. Um, we don't have to be in, in tight contact, but just knowing that there are others out there doing the same work, focusing on the same goal of keeping families together whenever possible, and but doing adoption well when it's not possible to keep families together. I think that's, um, it, it feels like we're, we're building a net, a network um, that, that we're carrying on from people before us. Sarah? I was just going to say beautifully said, I, I feel the same way, April. And, and I think back to kind of just to circle back earlier about, um, you know, people not being able to take it. I think that's what's so important is to feel that net, just to bask in the net and to, to just have these conversations and to, to network together because it's, it's, it can be hard. I mean, it's a really, it's a, it's a hard system. It, we all come from trauma, we come from pain, and then you're, and, and we, we're all passion oriented people. If we're activists in any way, we've got some passion and some deep desire for change and um, high burnout. So it's just really nice to be in community together. And I really appreciated your words and so thankful for your time today. This was lovely. I enjoyed it so, so much. And I hope we can do it again. And Thanks for the encouragement and for doing all the work and may, may we see each other in the world and other places as we go. Well, in the meantime, I'll just look forward to your next episode and the next and the next, but thank you. for now, thanks to everyone for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please like it and rate it and share it wherever you listen to help others find adoption unfiltered. It's through healthy engagement that we can make the changes needed for all of those affected in adoption. Please visit adoptionunfiltered.com for other episodes and for more information about our other projects, including our book, Adoption Unfiltered. Thanks for being with us.